Hi, welcome to our newest video. Um, this is on rock lawn and it's cut out here at the bottom. Um, we've got grapes hanging from the bottom of our harvest ward here. We've got a crackled background on the rock lawn with um, a stencil and faux finish kind of background paper look. We've used some stamps, we've used all kinds of, it's a multimedia project. Um, we've got a background paper clock up here. Um, we're doing dry brushing on a light background, which I think that you'll find very, very interesting. Um, it made all of the details on this much faster to do. We're also harmonizing our colors using um, letting our background showing through and using washes to do our base coats. So it's a very, very simple project. It's very forgiving and um, there's a lot to learn. I hope you enjoy it. My journey down the um, antiqued kind of rock lawn began with this table runner that I did. This is a, a photograph of the magazine um, layout that I did for, it's a big two foot by two foot square table thing that you put in the middle of your dining table and then I've got this bird cage there. But I had done the um, poinsettia and I really, really, really adored how it came out. So I started kind of thinking, well this was a little bit antique. What, what can I do a little bit more? So as I, this was in um, Paintworks winter 2011 and the um, so then I thought well I want to do a nutcracker because my my one son Christopher collects nutcrackers and I thought well that poinsettia looks like it'd be brilliant at the bottom of a rock lawn so this is just rock lawn fabric um, banner and I thought wouldn't it be interesting of course to keep the colors kind of uniform so if you did the points at a table runner you could do this but why would you hang a nutcracker in your kitchen or you know in your dining room so then I thought the journey is interesting so then I thought well why couldn't it be something seasonal that you could hang on the um, a, a banner topper and so I just got mine taped I would encourage you to do something just slightly more permanent than this so this piece feeds in here hangs on your wall and so you can replace that with a different season all the time and so what I wanted to do is keep something neutral up here so that I could do um, whatever I could do something that would work in a kitchen all the time at the bottom so this is what I've got here okay so then I thought well he turned out so awesome what if I do them in season so that you can have four of them and so I've got a patriotic nutcracker and we've got, and they've got all the different cutout bottoms to them. They've got the Pilgrim Nutcracker. And then I've got, of course, the Lucky Charm Shamrock Nutcracker. And he's got the cutout as well. So, you know, I did that season, and that's great. That's Christmassy. That's if you want to do Christmas all through the year. If you want nutcrackers, um, people collect them. Not for everybody, maybe. Um, excellently popular, obviously. But um, anyway, so. Then I thought, well, what if we do something? And it was kind of what inspired it was this line of stamps that I got. That is Journey to France. Okay. And so in the Journey to France stamps, which are what these are right here, um, I thought, you know, I'd love, look, look, look how this just looks like it could hang from there, maybe just slightly brighter. But these are just, this is just me messing around. Look on the Journey to France um, page for how to use the stamps and stuff like that, but I show you how I messed around with just a little bit of ink and a stamp. But what I, I can't do for Toll TV is show you this old project with this. So I'm going to recreate this slightly different, but I'm going to use basically the same palette for it and um, just show you some of the techniques that I used. And then we're going to do a chicken banner with some grapes at the bottom and a word and do this elegant kind of French country um, kitchen kind of thing. So that way it bridges us into a kitchen that you might um, what might be a little bit more uniform. All right, one of the things that you want to do before you get started with this project is you want to um, seal this surface because this is that um, MDF, I think it is. Is it MDF? It's another name for it, I thought. Anyway, but it's like a particle kind of board. And you want to use, if you're going to use the cracker, texture crackle, you want to use the sealer that comes with the DecoArt product. I didn't have to use it on the um, on the banners, and I didn't notice a problem. But I did use it once on wood, and it was kind of funky. And so I thought mm, maybe we just need to go ahead and use it. 
Um, but I'll show you the right way and then you can decide to experiment. Now I'm using this yellow varnish sponge and it's just going to wipe this right on there and it eliminates too many drips and things, although right there I see that I got a little bit in that crack. Just use brush. But we have a new, um, a new man on campus and I wanted to try this out. I haven't used it yet. It's a mushroom sponge and what this does is it gives you a handle way out. It's a little bit more ergonomically correct. This one's pretty tall and it does keep your fingers out pretty good. This one's just a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and see if this measures up. It's a little bit rougher sounding. And I should have left out, of course, because I switched sponges. And I'll go ahead, just in good practice, it's a good idea to go ahead and always varnish or seal both sides of your surface. I've got on a pair of black nit nitro gloves because I don't like stuff on my hands. I don't care how safe manufacturers say things are. I say I'm going to trust the gloves. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and get that on there. Even it out. And you know, I have to say, I think I'm a fan. Um, I don't, this is not a product I'm going to name, but I think I'm a fan of the yellow ones. They just seem to go on just a little bit less chunky and more smoothly. That one made just kind of a pretty big mess. It seems a little stiffer, which I think is what's causing it. Anyway, so you want to go ahead and always do both sides. This is one of those things, I'm going to set this aside for a second. Um, one of those things that um, I do all the time is I, I brought this in. I had to order this in a, a set of two. Is this useless? I don't think so. I could use this for various and sundry, all kinds of things. Is this a little bit better? I don't know if you can tell. This is just much stiffer. This is much more flexible. This is made out of a harder fabric or product. I go through and I test all the products on the website like this. I actually use them, actually try them, actually play with them, actually screw it up, and then um, and that way I can tell. And in this case, I thought it was interesting to go ahead and try them both on camera to see. Uh, I normally don't do that just because I don't like to dog other people's um, stuff, but this will be one product that you won't end up seeing on the website because it's just, in my opinion, this is better. This is twice as much money as this for the handle. I'd love it to have a handle. Um, that would be great, but I'll do without my handle. I'll buy myself a pair of gloves, and I'll just go and deal with it that way. Okay, the very first thing I have to do for my banner topper after I've sealed it is I have to decide which one of my clock um, designs I'm going to use. I think what I'm going to do for this, these are sized to do um, CDs, so you can actually put them on an old CD or DVD, and you can make it into a little clock, paint on it. This one is not so handy for painting within, and I like the weight of it, and since I'm going to paint all around it, I think I'm going to go with this one right here. Um, this one's Victoria's Station. So I'll get out my little scissor, and I'll go ahead and cut that out. One of the things that I think I might want to use on my piece, and I've got a stamp that does this, so I'm going to leave this for right now, but if I wanted to, I could take and cut out the motifs and use them interchangeably. Um, you can save your big clock for a larger clock. You can tear and sand these papers as well, so don't feel like you're, you know, you could take a piece of it and put it into a collage type thing if you wanted to. Um, you can also save the extra little bits of paper and use those as well. You can stamp them and then glue those on. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and cut stuff out. But I wanted to share, there's a good way, with all of these you can adjust your level of antiqueness. So this paper is the Ambrose Nash background paper, and I think I'm going to tear bits of this and use it. It came this way with this very vanilla corner, um, not very, very antiqued. What I did is I used a little bit of gel stain medium and my brush, and I gave it this rustic corner, and then I spattered it. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you right now, just to give you a little bit of information. So what I've got is I've got staining and antiquing medium, and I've just got some bittersweet chocolate. Um, I'm going to just, I normally I would probably float this, but I'm loading it on the, the front of my brush, the nose of my brush, and I'm just going to use that as a kind of a floating type mechanism here. I'm going to get that kind of wet with the medium and draw that out. Okay, and then I can go in with my finger if I want to, 
I could go in with more just plain medium, draw that out. The most important thing for this is you want to have just something for it to slide around on. The more medium you have in your paint, the more um, transparent it'll be. Okay, and what's good about this is I can just kind of sneak up on my corner and it's got a good little open time. If you use it on wood, it can reactivate with water, um, so it's a good idea to spray it when you get done. So now I've got my little corner redone. I could go into this and I could put some aged spots in here as well if I wanted to. Um, depending on, you know, the look that you want. You know, you've got to decide what that look is. You can tear the edges of your paper. I would blow dry this or um, just allow it to dry naturally. You can um, tear, you can burn. Be careful with the burning, obviously. Um, then I can go in here and I can spatter. And that's just going to give it a little bit more patina. I think a really fun thing to do would be to give it a little fleck of metallic. Let's do that next. I'm going to use just a little bit of brass, which is a very nice bright gold color. Put on my palette. And a little bit maybe of bronze, which has a nice rusty red kind of look. You can mix these if you want to. You can um, put them in any medium, clay, anything, just any medium you want, um, except water, which will they'll brush off if you put them in water. And I'm looking for, I guess I'll use a little multi-purpose sealer right now. I want something that will actually, and that's not clear, I'll go get something else. Okay, I've got a little bit of matte varnish. Now, I could suspend these metals in this um, sealer, but I, for my purposes for showing you, it's not a very good example. So when you mix them in, the medium, that is the look that you're going to get. It's just that beautiful, awesome kind of aged copper. I'm going to add a little water, and then I'm going to come over here and put just a little bit, and I think I'll sneak in some of that brass over here, just a little bit, fly specking. You're going to see it and you're going to wonder what it is, but you're not going to be like, oh look, here's gold. Okay, so that's going to add a really nice little flavor or touch. Have fun with these. Just do whatever you want. But so if you get your background papers and you feel like a little bit more of this kind of burned, rubbed edge, you could um, certainly add it with paints. We've um, recently added these little um, doodads from the website as well that could be used. This is Distress Ink. And this is a little pad that you can change with a little Velcro. And I can just mat that on there. And I can just rub on a little bit of aging here and there. And this does a really authentic, nice job. Um, it's just got that, I don't know, transparency that ink has. And I really do like that very much as well. Super simple to do. So before I even get started, I think I am going to go ahead and distress my clock face just a little bit. The last one that I did, I kept it very clean and white. Okay, very, very clean. Um, I did spatter over the edges and then antique the edge. But I think before I glue this down and get some other stuff on it, I want to go ahead and give it just a little bit. This It's got a little bit of it here. I want it a little bit everywhere. And I don't want to do it to my cut edge, so I want to do this beforehand. You can do this without or with. Um, another idea that you can do, if you've got a different surface in mind or something. Okay, I like a little bit of that. So we just distress it lightly with the distress ink. And then we'll go in and I think we need to do definitely some spatters. So I'll just water down. I could do the spatters after. And then I think I will go into this goldy kind of color. A lot of times spattering is better to do after because you don't quite know what you're going to do. But I think I've got a good idea. I'll say that and then I'll change it all later, right? Okay, so I'll let this dry. 
and then I'm going to cut out my hole right there, which you're going to need something tiny and exact. And so what you can do for that is this little doodad right here. This is a fingertip cutter, and it has a little swivel blade. And these little swivel blades have been around for a while, but the, the fingertip has not. And what that allows you, I wouldn't cut on my black mat. This is my nonstick mat. Um, it definitely cuts. Um, I've done that. So, but what it does is as you go around, it swivels so that you can always be looking forward. You don't have to be turning your project around. Um, I wouldn't use it on this big edge because I'm going to want a very, very precise, I'm going to go kind of slow with my scissors. But on this little tiny thing where I would have a heck of a time getting my scissors in, definitely here. Put it on a glass tile, I use my glass palette, um, and then just get it cut out that way. Now remember that you can use these bits like this. If you want to, you can take your little stampy stamp thing. If you want to have a collage type look, and let's do postage stamp. Where are you? Okay. Put it on your clear block. They're sticky on the back side. You can make yourself a piece of collage paper, okay, that you stamp and And so now you can take this and you could tear this and now you've got a little piece of collaging paper that's not all straight and stuff like that. And you could burn it and you could do all that kind of stuff as well. But how cool that you just made, you know, your own piece of, you know, collage paper. My sealer's dry now so I'll take my sanding disc and just lightly even that out. Okay, just knock off the higher tooth if you have any on the sides. You can leave your edge alone or you can base cut it, whichever you feel. If I can leave it alone, I think I'd rather. You want to apply one coat of desert sand, or bleach sand, sorry, to both the, the banner and the, um, the banner itself and your topper. I recommend, if you think, I, I'm going to already have a couple more of these um, seasons and I'm going to do them on similar backgrounds um, at least that's you know always the plan and my son Joe is probably rolling his eyes right now because sometimes I don't get all my plans done because I'm optimistic and don't realize how much time I don't have anyway my plan is to do another one I want to do a pineapple I've got just like it's such a great idea um, so I do want to do more I could see hydrangeas hanging on the bottom of them going to some flowers and fruits and stuff if you had a plan like mine and you wanted to do a couple of different seasons for your kitchen or wherever you're going to hang this, then it would be a great idea to prep multiples of the banners, the background parts, um, at the same time. That way you go through the same steps all at one time. So for example, when I did the um, Nutcracker set, I did all of my base coats all at the same time. That way I was already done one set of mess, one set of everything in that background. They all look the same because I was doing them all at once. They, I had the same attitude, you know, that kind of sometimes we get into moods. So definitely all at one time if you're going to do more. Um, and if you're not and you don't get it done, then fine, figure it out later, right? But um, anyway, that's my recommendation. So one coat covered that pretty well. And then we're going to do the next coat as a slip slap. The reason that we want one coat of something on there is this wood being quite dark. If I slip slap on that, then what's going to happen is the color when you slip slap will lift off and it will expose whatever the undercoat is. If it exposes the undercoat, then what I have down there is this other strange color wood. I want it to lift off and expose my bleach sand. So you always put down that very first coat, let it dry. It doesn't have to be pretty, just let that very first one get going there. Now get out desert sand and I'll put that on my palette. I went ahead and blow dried. And I want to go ahead and put the nose of this into the desert sand. And now what I'm going to do is go on here and I'm just going to slip slap every old which way. Making a kind of rustic looking mess. I 
don't want there to be, I want it to be kind of random. I can use the back side, the, the heel of my brush, it's not really a brush, but to blend things together smoothly. You do want to be very careful not to make, um, not to make it all blend together. I'm not trying to base coat this, I'm trying to make a background effect. So I'm just kind of smudging it on there and trying to make it look mottled and different. I want it to kind of go with my colors and obviously this is going to be a little bit of a stretch for me so I'm going to have to put a little bit more of something else going on on there. One of the best tips that I have um, for rollers is to go ahead and put the roller head into a baggie, pull it off, and then seal it in there and burp out all the air. And what that does is it keeps your roller head um, clean and tidy, or airtight, I guess. And then when you put it in, you can put it in the freezer, refrigerator, you can leave it on your desk. Um, it'll keep like this on my desk for a couple of weeks. So now I have a neutral colored. I always keep a black one on hand and a neutral color one. So if I wanted to mix this into some blues, I'd have one ready to go. So I'll put that aside and I'll have it ready for me when I need it later to do my, um, my banner itself. Okay, next we're going to use Deco Arts Deco Page. I think that's how they're pronouncing it because they've got Deco and then the apostrophe and then the page there. Uh, might be decoupage, I don't know. But here is what I like about this. I had to test this with these background papers. Um, I did a tray um, that I was working on for Christmas and every time I was using um, an old product that has been around for a long time, and every time I would try painting on top of it, it reactivated the glue. And it would make air bubbles, and it would wrinkle, and it would tear, and it did all kinds of things. So I had to actually go finding and seeking. Decor came out with this product, and it was one of my test products, and it was actually the best. I was kind of thrilled about that. Um, so I'm going to, I've force dried my banner topper. Here's what I'm going to do. This is the process for all things decoupage, or at least how I do it. You apply some glue to your background. I use the matte deco page um, because I don't want it shiny later on because things slide off of shiny. Okay, so I'll get that on there. Okay, that's kind of grabbing and sticking and doing all kinds of stuff. Now I'm going to get gunky on my hands and I don't like that, so I'm going to get on my gloves, which are still wet from washing. I did a test with a little piece of plastic earlier and I had a epic failure and so I had to wash my hands with my gloves. I had to wash the gloves with my hands in them. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to put this glue on the back there. Okay, get it on there nice where, you know, things are going to lift on the edges and stuff like that. I'm on my nonstick mat so I don't care um, what kind of mess I make my non-stick gloves. Now you want to make sure that you keep this upside right um, with your 12 up going north. If I can find my 12. Okay, and we'll line the hole up. Oop, that's not straight. And I think this will be a time for a T-square moment. Just make sure that I'm straight. So I should go from line to line. I'm off a little bit. Still off a little bit, but it's really. Okay, that's better. Now I just got to yank it down a little bit. Okay, now you smooth out the bubbles. Go ahead and apply it. I've talked the darn thing dry underneath there. And now you apply glue. Yeah, I talked it dry. So I'll just peel this back and reactivate down there. I'll stick that on and apply a coat of the glue over the top. I'm going to just burp out bubbles. These oval glaze brushes, you need one of these in your toolbox. They're good for everything can float with them, you can make just all manner of stuff. Okay, so I'm using my hands just to burp out anything I see. If you got something specifically trapped underneath there, 
don't worry if this will lift back up don't worry about that um, because it will dry in contact okay now the hard part is just to let that sit there and let it do its thing and leave it alone while it's doing its thing okay this is um, banner size rock lawn um, when we cut it at the studio we um, keep it in a roll that way you don't get any creases. When we ship it to you, we fold it lightly, put it in the package, and it spends a day folded going to you. When you get it, roll it back up. Um, that is to keep it from, make sure that you don't keep it in a little square package. Um, that way you don't end up with wrinkles and things like that. If you get wrinkles, what you can do is you can iron up to linen temperature. You test yours, obviously every iron is going to be different. Um, you can mist it with water, you can use a pressing cloth. And one of my um, customers emailed and said that they had something wrong with wrinkles and things like that, and they actually weighted down the bottom. They um, hung it and then weighted it and then came back the next day and it was better. So try some of those type things out. And in the meantime, what I have found is that the more coats of stuff you get on it, the more your wrinkles go away. So if you do have a problem with that, go ahead and base coat it and see what happens. And you might be surprised at how much goes away. Okay, in this case, I'm looking to see if I could get this banner is rather long because my nutcrackers were a rather long subject. But I'm kind of thinking, like I could, if I fit to can't quite fit two side by side. If you snudged it a little bit, you could. But I can definitely fit two side by side here. So I'm just going to prep one piece. I'm prepping on the rough side. And then I will cut two out of this and I will just make this a little bit shorter. I think I can get by with that with roosters, not so much with tall nutcrackers. Now there's no need to seal or anything on the rock one, but I do want to make sure that I'm watching where I'm putting my edge. If you do this and slide it through your wet paint, you're going to end up with stuff on the back. It's also a good idea if you're going to put something on the back to do it at the same time so that you prevent any errors. Okay, and I'll have, I'll just have a mixed color going right on there because my roller's dirty. The only way that I have ever found to do a good job of base coating rock lawn is to use a roller. Okay, so just roll that on doesn't matter if it's a little bit darker than the other. We're going to adjust everything anyway with washes and glazes and stuff. And we'll get this on. We'll allow it to dry. And we'll go to the next step, which is going to be that slip slop. Now, Rocklon stays wet for a pretty long time. So you do want to plan ahead when you're prepping. Um, for example, I want to paint this tomorrow. So I'm making sure that I'm getting it done today before I leave. Um, so that I have enough time for it to cure. You can tell if your rock lawn is wet by um, if it's cold or not. Okay, so we're going to do the same technique that we did on the topper. And we'll re-wet this with this color so that we get a kind of a blend. Okay. Now, if I wanted to, I could do some aged things underneath, but I'm not going to worry about that. Just get a nice good coat. This is going to need to be sanded just a little bit when I get done. Okay. And so we'll go into the desert sand. Okay, we'll go towing into desert sand. And then we'll just slip slappy some of this color here and there. With this, I don't want to leave these square chunks like that. So I will go in and blend them out just a little bit more. They don't look very good. Now there's going to be a big chicken there, there's going to be some grapes, that kind of stuff. So you don't have to worry about it too much, but you don't want it to be too obvious either. And you don't want it to be um, with a pattern. Sometimes on a big area like this you can get patterns. So we want to make sure that we go in and go every which way. I'm standing up as I roll. Just get a nice random looking pattern here. Allow it to dry and we'll go from there. So I've got this fantastic long, three foot long and only one foot wide cutting board. That's actually double sided as well. So you have a high contrast on one side and lower contrast on the other. I'm going to line this up to see, this is my selvage edge, this is my cut edge and I know it's not gonna be straight so 
Um, whenever we sell the rock lawn here, we make sure that we um, allow a little bit of overage. All right, so this is obviously not straight, so I'm going to use my giant T-square. Okay, that's going to keep me straight and make things square. I'm going to use my T-square over here near the edge, and I'm going to cut that straight. I'll mark it and cut it. Okay, and I'll cut two of these out of this. Okay, and in this case, I'm going to want, um, I would either use a rotary cutter or I would use a good sharp pair of scissors because we want this finished edge to be very finished. And if it doesn't come out finish, finished, go ahead and give yourself a little paint on the edge just to give it um, that completely sealed up kind of look or finish, I guess. Now what I'll do is I'll also take my L square and I just want to make sure that my corners are indeed square. Okay, and I'll line those two up and it looks pretty good. So don't forget, don't underestimate the power of a good square. If you have astigmatism, you will have a lot of leaning things. So you need a T-square. They've got um, big ones and little ones. Um, so this is my casual everyday one and then this is for my longer projects. L-squares will keep your corners square. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to apply the texture crackle to this. This is um, De Deco Arts Texture Crackle. And this looks a little kind of like suspicious as far as the fact that it's in these lumps and chunks. Unless it's dried and crackly, this is a thixotropic kind of uh, material, which means that it will get creamier as you work it. Just like clay or something like that. It has a thixotropic, um, I just love to say the word, right, um, property to it. So we're going to just work it. And now notice it's just nice and creamy. Looks like cake frosting. Okay, now what we're also wanting to do is we're going to put in some of our desert sand and some of our bleach sand. So put some of each of those out. Okay, we'll make two piles. So I'll just move some of this. You don't want to break the foundation. I use the non-tinted one because I can then tint it to the color I want. I believe it's like 50%. Um, you don't want to put more than 50% of paint in it or you'll break the, the crackle ability of the, this product. Okay, so then mix our second batch. I'm going to do a couple of these, so I probably need a little bit more than normal. And see those things just falling out there. Let's see, is that, is that going to be, nope, that's hard. So that's one of my hard little upper edgies. I'll just get rid of those. Make sure you seal your bottle well. All right, I'm gonna bring in some of this. And I'll kick you out. And somewhere in here, I have a little lump there. I'll we'll find it. Let me scrape it out. Okay. So we'll wipe all this stuff off. This will harden and do all that kind of stuff when it's left with air. So you want to make sure that you seal everything. You could give it a little mist with a little water to keep it moist in there. All right, now we're going to do the crazy technique. So we're going to pick up some of this, pick up a little bit of this. And it'll just be kind of a, like a stucco kind of look. This is a three-sided squeegee. This side is fantastic for cleaning off my mat. It needs to be scraped. What I love about this is you can really add a lot of textured look to just what is a flexible banner. And it stays flexible. Now I know I'm going to have an image. There's that little hard chunk thing. I know I'm going to have an image up the middle, so we'll work around those parameters. And I also know I'm going to do a lot of dry brushing and dry rubbing and things like that. I'm going to mix that down. Okay. And it's random and it's flat. And that was paint, but that's okay. And then the edges we'll do with um, dry rubbing and things. And then we'll go ahead and do our clock top as well. 
gonna have to mix some more. Okay, and this one we're gonna bring over into the clock a little bit. Now we're gonna have to do some color um, rubbing and things like that as well. You can decide how spongy you want it, how old and textured. Okay, that's just going to get us one more level of stuff. Right, the thing I love best about these black non-stick mats is the paint it will just come right off of these. So what I will do is I will, and the other thing that I love is that when I have it and I know it's clean, I know that I'm on a very clean surface and I'm not going to end up with a whole bunch of um, goobers that will be underneath my paint project. Um, if you don't want a non-stick mat, using a towel on your work surface can be good, although on a flexible thing like a, like a, a rock lawn banner, um, if you had any give on your towel, which you would, then it won't it won't do as good a job as you want it to for keeping the area clean and um, that kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is take my, I just misted it with water, and I can just take this and just loosen all the grime from my base coating. And that just gives me that initial I don't have to scrub at anything. And it's really not a scrubbing type action. Um, I misted with water. This just gives me a nice broad cleanup tool. Okay, and then I will just take a damp paper, paper towel and then just wipe that off. All right, so I've got, this is dry, but I've got some pretty high points on it. So I want to go ahead and sand it down just a little bit. Knock off any of the high stuff. Whew, brush off the dust. Okay. Then after I'm done, I'm going to want to make sure that my table is clean because I don't want these little nubs and knots underneath my project as well. I'll sand my topper as well. The project that we're doing has three elements to it. It has the chicken, a word, and grapes. The chicken came from the autumn clip art disc, and this has a whole bunch of clip art on it, and the cornucopia project on the website um, also came from this, and there's more as I get them painted and stuff. But um, this is what this is for is it has a bunch of um, drawings that symbolize that season and this is autumn and so harvest and it just has drawings on it and you can resize them and paint them and do whatever you want so that's on there this is not available available for purchase but it does come as bonuses so watch emails and things like that for opportunities and then the harvest word came from the autumn book of words so what that means book of words is this is the faith and inspiration book of words comes with a CD, a laminated cover sheet, and then the book of words itself. Okay, and what this does for us is it takes words like, say, faith here, and our graphic design team styles it into a beautiful formatted word, and um, then we go through and we have different themes. So we have Halloween, we have clock face embellishments, and clock face book. Clock face book is very useful because it's a whole bunch of clock faces that, um, in this case, it's not words. But you can print this out any size and then trace it, and all your numbers are going to be in the right position. So you don't have to figure that out. It is very difficult to figure out. Okay, we've got Diva. We've got Christmas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It just goes through. We've got the wine edition. So you can pick your theme of words. And then you can just copy, enlarge, and whatever. Um, and the way that you enlarge is you would take, say you wanted to, let's find one that we like. Be yourself. No one can No one can ever tell you you're doing it wrong. So I want to print that on a card or on a wall for somebody or something like that. I can take this page out and lay it on my copier and blow it up that way. Or I can use the disk in which each of these images, thats that would be an image, are saved as PDFs and JPEGs, so you can enlarge them easily that way. The tool that you'll use to enlarge is a sizing dial. And the sizing dial, let's get in. This one is one that people kind of cross their eyes at because they figure out how to use it. It's really easy. But I'll show, I'd like to show it as often as I can because we get a lot of questions about this. Okay, so say, 
and it says right here on the outside, I think part of the problem is there's a lot of information on this. This says size of the original, so that's on this disc, right? And this one says reproduction size. So what you're going to do is if the size of my original is, say, it's 5 inches, okay? And say I want it to be 5 feet, or say I want it to, so it would, we'll do 3 feet, okay? So say it's 3 feet. I'm going to line up the 5 feet with the 3 feet, so that's 36 inches, okay? I'll line those two up. That's the reproduction size. That's the original size right across. That is going to be a little more than 700% that I'm going to enlarge it. Okay, and what that, what is perfect about this is you never have to question or make a bunch of copies again. You're going to know that it's going to fit exactly where you want it to fit. So just an easy tool. You'll never ever resize something the wrong way and waste a bunch of ink and waste a bunch of paper. Getting ready to trace my pattern, and so I wanted to share with you a couple of tricks that are really awesome. I've seen over and over again where people um, end up with their pattern shifting, especially when we have something that's a little bit more elaborate like this is. There's just a lot of parts to it. It's not huge, it's just bigger. So what I'm going to do is cut, cut a little hole where there is no pattern, okay, somewhere in the middle. You can tear it, whatever you need to do. Okay, and we're going to find our tape. Okay, we're going to get lined up, throw things on the floor. And then what we'll do is we'll just take our tape, and we're going to tape over the, um, the holes. And what this does for us, if you tape at the top or the bottom, then what you can do is you get a lot of shift in your paper. But notice this doesn't shift at all, okay? And that's, you know, me trying to make it shift. And the reason it doesn't is it's on both sides, okay? So you've got two anchor spots in the middle. If you were at the top, then you'd get that paper shifting. Now the other trick that I like to do is I like to take my um, transfer paper and I like to have it so that it is smaller, so that when I'm pressing, I'm not on this. So I'll put it in. I'll start here in the middle. Okay, so I can just lift it up and shift it, and then I can trace. Now, if I feel like that's getting in the way, this is actually about two times bigger than I normally use, so I would move it over, and I'd have my hand out here to do this. That way I'm not pressing a bunch of smudge marks on my project. The other thing that I love and I wouldn't do without if I could possibly help it is the, the Triple Threat Ghost Writer. It has a white ceramic lead, a gray ceramic lead, and a roller ball that has no ink in it. And what that means, and it has a padded grip, okay, what that means for you is you are going to um, have, it's comfortable, like the little wooden ones, I don't know why, but I death grip them when I'm tracing my pattern and it's, it's my hand is so sore I can't paint that day. So um, I love this because it just glides along, um, you know, just just goes where you tell it to. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm using a worn out piece of graphite paper. I'll just go ahead and give my pattern a trace. I'm going to do just the outer outer edges of things. I don't want to trace in inner details just yet. And I'm trying to see if there's anything strange about this. I've got it going from edge to edge and top to bottom, leaving just a little bit of space. I always cut these out at the end. That way I'm cutting on the painted surface and I don't have to try. If you try to paint and smudge and do some things down on these edges, um, some of the shortcut tricks that I have, then what's going to happen is you would bend them and fold them and hurt them. So we always do that part last. One of the things that you need to pay attention to, I've got a very worn out piece of graphite paper and I did four letters and then I peeked. You always want to peek right after you do the very first thing. That way you can see how strong your graphite's going to be. And you know, like I'm on a whole bunch of texture here, like that was a very textury spot. Um, it's not going to trace as cleanly as it would if I was on flat. So you want to check it, that way you don't have, I don't want it really dark, but I don't want it really light either. I want to be able to see it and I don't want to waste my time. Okay, I've got two sizes of stencils that I think will be interesting for this. This actually comes in a 6x6 and a 12x12. And one of the reasons that I went ahead and traced my pattern on, this has got to darken up considerably to match my clock. Okay, that's got to get to a much more umberish tone. 
But what I want to do is I want to know where my chicken lies so that I can put a little bit of that underneath in that background behind him. And then I want to do a little bit with these stencils, although I'm running out of room here, so I may not have too much room for this one, but this is just a beautiful one. It's called Damask. And so now I've got to figure out what I want to do. And then I also want to stamp and do some things like that. Let me stamp first and we'll see where we get. This is a set of stamps called Journey to France, and they cling onto here. As I'm getting ready to stencil and do some of my detailing, I'm not certain, this is a screen and not a stencil, I'm not certain if I'm going to like it with a light chicken wire look or not, so this is where my little sample piece, my little overrun sample piece that I cut off between the two banners will come in handy. I'll be able to practice on here and see what I like. <clears throat> Shouldn't take too much for me to see. Now this we're going to have to either spritz or tap because if I rub it, I'm going to have to really be conscious of holding it down, which is working actually okay. I can't really use tack it over and over on this because this is very delicate. So you want to make sure that you keep things kind of lined up. Let's lift that off. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's got almost like an eggshell kind of quality. Can lay it back over. Go into a little bit deeper color. It's hit and miss. Let's do a little bit of random here and there. Okay, I think that, that's got a kind of neat quality. I think I, I could like that. All right, then we can take and we can spritz. To do the mist it, this is a mist it. You can put thin paint in there, but first you have to kind of disintegrate the paint in the water. So let's pretend like we're going to go into this color right here, which is like a raw sienna. I'll just use an old ratty brush and I'll just munch it in there and get it all disintegrated. And then I store these with water in them, so I'll just pour out a little bit of water. For travel purposes, it makes it much easier if you have a little bit in there already. And I'll dump that in there. And then shake, shake, shake. Blah. Okay, and then let's see what we get with this. This may not be dark enough. That may be something that I'll have to um, darken up the, the color with it. Because the more water, obviously, you put into your paint. What's kind of nice about this, like this is kind of tone on tone. We'll just lift this up and see if it appears at all. And it's kind of a little too soupy to really show. So we'll go in, dump a little bit of that water out. Let's make it darker. See if it was too soupy or too light. Now you want to keep these uh, mistits clean. So as you use them, you know, rinse them out and spritz clean water through the nozzle. Alright. Okay, now let's go over here and let's try this again. <clears throat> And you want to spray straight down. That's showing much nicer. Let's see if our chicken wire. Not so much because, why? Because our um, screen is not stuck down. If I had my tacket over and over on there, it would be much nicer. So I think I'm going to have to do the rubbing. But I still like the idea if after I have this rubbing, I can go over here and I can just kind of mist my edges just a little bit and that gives just a random kind of um, dreamy look. Very watery, very dreamy. Okay, so good piece of testing here. Put that away for a second and now let's go ahead and build a background. Alright, so we're going to dry rub. We're going to um, start with khaki tan. And we'll use our medium crescent stencil brush. These are fantastic because they're cut on an oval and cut on an oval. They're not blunt like other um, stencil brushes are. And we'll rub on the edge. Always antiquing just kind of brings the eye in. 
What's neat about this, go ahead and rub up to the top. This is going to catch on some of this stuff that we've already put in place. So that's going to make it look, um, just give it a little bit more of a textured look because it's catching on the edges of things. And so now obviously we won't do down here on these corners. Just, we probably want to do up in and amongst the grapes. Be careful about obliterating your lines. You probably don't want no, that's a leaf. Just in where there's spaces. If it was pure white, it would look kind of strange. I think we'll go through our word. Up the sides. We want to leave this space in here a little bit lighter. Once again, to help bring the eye in. This is so technical, you can do it with your eyes shut, so don't feel like you're getting into some kind of scary project here, because it's actually super simple. Okay, now this brown color, which is espresso, will be in from the edge. Now see, that got just a little bit strong. One thing that this does, this technique does, is it grabs where it's wet. So really, truly, we'll start over here where it's not wet anymore and then we'll move our way over here and I'll show you how to handle that if you get one of those situations. And now I'll mist this up in and over the area and this is a great opportunity for me to lay down my stencil and get my fingers out of it. Take just a little bit of each color so I'm not too dark, not too light. And I'll just go ahead and add a little bit of that detailing here and there, so I get enough of a chicken wire effect. And go into a little bit of the raw sienna. Okay, and I'll just lift it to see. Oh, it's got just a little bit of an effect. Okay. Yeah, that I like. I like that very much. We'll darken around him. We've got this little edgy poo over here, which we can just use a slightly lighter color to lighten it up. Okay, so we just like putting on a little bit of makeup. I think I want my colors a little bit warmer, so I'm going to go into the Rossi Anna. don't know that I'm going to have room for any more stenciling up the sides. My chicken is rather large. Okay, I think for right now we'll stop there and see what we see when we're, when we're done. Okay, now up here we'll see what we have room for. So same technique. Just going to bring it in from the edge. Get you on camera. Go ahead and do this edge. Pretend like everything's going to be seen and you'll be much safer. I'm going to bring that, see how I want to join that claw color together. I'm going to mix the traditional, the raw sienna with the khaki to give it that same kind of warmth. Bring that out. Don't want it freestanding over here by itself. And a little white bullseye. Okay, so rub, rub, rub. I'll bring some rubbing into the middle just to kind of change that tone. The neat thing about dry rubbing is it really acts like almost like a glaze. So now that's a little bit more tone even. We'll go into the espresso. Deepen it down just a little bit. Okay, 
Okay, so now that's not sticking out just quite so much as it was before. I could put a little bit of my chicken wire here. Just to add a little bit of texture. Okay, not showing very much because I already darkened. If I'd have done that on the light, it would have shown much better. And now let's take out our, which one is this? This is Damask. Now my normal thing is I would use Tack It Over and Over, but I don't know that I'm going to have to on this one because it's fairly, I'm going to run this off the edge just a little bit. I'm going to get into my dark color. This one's got a fairly heavy body to it, and I'm doing it on a really textured surface. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, that just adds some interest. I like that. Okay, line up the same side. If you don't have a lot of paint on your brush, then you're not going to have a bleed under issue. you need to clean your stencil, you can clean it with um, just warm soapy water using your fingers. If you have tack it over and over on it, it's very difficult to clean that off. Um, you can soak it in our brush cleaner and that will um, help you remove it. All right, the next thing that I want to do is put some multimedia effects in the background. I can cut and paste and do a whole lot of papers, but because I'm on this flexible um, background, I don't really want the weight of papers giving me, I don't know, challenges, I guess. So I'm going to use the vintage photo color of this Distress Ink. <clears throat> and I'm going to use this clear block and I'm going to use cling stamps. Let's put a little Eiffel Tower in the background. I'm going to give them a little bit of a country city look. Okay, we'll just stamp this, let's see, randomly. I have to do it a little bit more. Okay, it's a little bit stronger color. We'll switch and do, I'm going to do some words, I think. So this is just um, Parlez-vous Francais. And so I can just do Parlez-vous Francais kind of over and over again where I just want the look of words, but I don't want, it's almost going to look a little bit like cloth. Just randomly kind of put those in and out. Now, if you do a lot of this and you're mixing around, let me show you a little bit closer. I don't know if you can see. Okay, so um, if you're doing a lot of this, you might need to mist this with a little bit of Krylon matte spray. That's on the, it's K R Y L O N. Um, now, I'll peel this one off and I'll do maybe some postage. And I could actually do my postage all at one time and just bring them together. Okay, and this is just giving me some interest in my background. Okay, these just stick right back on there so you can find them later. Um, maybe a little fleur de lis moment. I think I think that's good. I'm going to use bittersweet chocolate to darken up my mix in my paint sprayer so that I can spatter this and mist it and make it be kind of dreamier. It's nice to do these details before you get any of your painting done because then you don't have to worry about um, messing up your painting or masking it off or anything like that. Okay. Always test these things on a place that you don't mind things getting messy. Okay, so I'm just going to take this and I'm going to mist it away from me. Whoops. Or right smack dab in the middle. So, no problem. Okay. Yeah, that just adds a nice look. 
right up through the middles. Okay, now so see what we have here. We have this dreamy look and we have it kind of modeling in, but we have our chicken a little bit haloed, which will give us a little bit like lights coming in and we can always intensify the light coming in later on if we want to. And I think we definitely need some metal in here, so we're going to go into that brass and we're going to get brass metal powders. Pull some of that out. You can suspend the metal powders in any liquid. Um, I prefer varnish just because it's easiest. And we're going to get out bronze. Okay, that's going to give us, I'm going to mix them. You can mix these. Okay, we'll get out some, keep your lid on, you don't want to breathe this stuff in, obviously, but these are actual metal fibers, metal powders. And, we've got matte varnish, and we'll just pull some of each of those in, just to tarnish our brass just a little bit, but to give it a warmth. All right, then we'll get out our spattering brush, which I love these White Wonder brushes. They're, this is a half inch, and it's an oval rake. Flat rakes leave almost like a blunt um, spatter effect. So you definitely want an oval rake. We want something cheap, but something that works. No, wait, not cheap, affordable, right? Okay, get my heavy handled something or another and tap. And now this, not thin enough. Got to be pretty thin to spatter off. I'm just going to sprinkle a little razzle-dazzle here and there. That's just going to catch the light, and you're not going to know quite what you're seeing, but you're going to know that you're seeing something. So I have two colors because I'm making this be more of the bronze in the second color. Okay, and I'll let that dry. Before I empty and clean out my missed it, I want to make sure that I missed my topper as well. Get a little too much there, I'll just wipe it around. Missed it just really makes a dreamy kind of look easy to do. Okay, we're getting there. As I'm getting ready to paint the rooster, um, I wanted to show you this is a pop top that I've painted. I use paint adhesion medium. And it just pops open. This is a sealed jar. Um, pops it right open and tears the plastic so I can peel that off. Very, very handy for your fingers. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm going to be doing here is doing a lot of washes. So what I want you to know is that a wash is 80% water. But now I've got my water basin and this one is a fairly new water basin, but sometimes your water, like I've got a little metallic powder in there because of rinsing out my brush and that. Um, sometimes I, if you wash and you have something in your water, like dirty water, um, it will leave ghost lines. So this is the um, studio um, brush basin. And I, this has this other compartment up here where I could put clean water for using my um, for doing my washes and things like that. That way I'm absolutely certain that this is going to be clean water even if this is all scungy from cleaning my brushes out. Kind of a handy little container. Alright, I've got my water. I'm going to blot my paper towel. I could also mix some in a puddle and then blot my paper towel until the shine goes completely away. I'm not like pressing, it's just um, blotting. Okay, and then because this is rough, I'm going to have to actually not have it quite so, um, quite so dry. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just fill in the areas. With this, this is um, shale green. When you're doing um, a wet and wet kind of or a, a glazing technique. You want to make sure that um, you keep things wet and moving. Don't stop or you'll get stop and start lines. Now because this is um, got this texture crackle and stuff like that on there, you might have it grabbing or whatever. Just keep enough water in your brush 
so that that is a non-problem. And this is definitely behaving way differently than it would if I didn't have that glaze on top of that crackle medium. It's not behaving badly, it's just behaving much differently. So I'm having to make sure that I have way more water than I normally would in my brush. Which is why we do different things, right? Just get that all washed and then allow it to dry completely. Some of this little bit of uneven texture and look, like the stencil is showing through because I've got just a wash on there, I'm actually going to use that and have that be part of what I'm doing, if that makes sense. And we'll go ahead, the same color, and we'll do this lower little wingette thing. A lot of people are really afraid of chickens um, as far as painting them because they, they're rather a loose um, rather a loose project, but we're not going to worry about that. This is going to be an easy chicken. Let's get out a red. I got out Crimson Tide and I got out... Crimson Tide is a very blue red and the country red is a very um, kind of orangey red. And which way to go? is I've got a lot of, so let's talk about this for a second, color. I have a whole lot of blues and purples on my palette because it's going to be, um, the grapes are going to be in those colors. So if I go with my orange color, then I'm going to kind of be crashing into the other side of the color wheel. I might want to just go ahead and stick with my um, blue red and get rid of the country red that I was thinking about. So don't forget that your different reds can be, or your different, now look at that. That's, apparently I haven't used Crimson Tide for a very long time. This is the medium that is, um, the paint particles are suspended in. Okay, so what we have to do is shake it up really well. Whenever you see that, it just means your paint's not shaken up. Okay, so that's a slightly different look. And we're still going to do the wash. So I'm going to try and keep this real transparent because I don't want real, real bold color. And that's going to be his comb. And so we'll wash that. A lot of you have seen dry brushing where we use the background as our um, base coat color or our deepest shadow color and then you dry brush highlights on it. I did that on the cornucopia um, project. Um, I'm going to dry brush today using um, not that technique. I want dry brushing to look like dried paint coming off my brush, but not like the rubbing because that's like a rouge and it's a little confusing. I'm going to go into my um, tail color, the shale green, and I'm going to load this. I've got a good size brush, a number 12. I'm going to load this in this um, Patty's Favorite Dry Brush or a very stiff filberted. They're very hard to find. This one is one that I searched for for years. Um, I'm going to load that until I've got a nice juicy wad up there. Then I'm going to go into my next color, Dirty Brush, so that it makes this new color down here. Very much exactly the same technique as dry brushing, but I'm going to use this to shadow instead of to darken. Okay, so I'm going to flip this over so that I'm comfortable. I have got my table's a mess right from the beginning. This is going to be interesting. Okay, so then I'm going to pull from my tail. I did a little technique um, trial up here. I'm going to pull from my tail here, pull in, allowing it to feather in. Okay, and that's going to kind of glaze over the whole thing. I think I need another feather right there. I'll reload that same color as I run out. I'm using the chisel of my brush and then flattening it as I pull in. Okay, then I'll inspect my handiwork upside right so I can tell what I'm doing. I'm keeping the juicy side to the top. I'm just going to pull that in. I'm going to try to make these shapes come together nicer. Okay. Now from there, I'm going to go into, and I probably want to address these um, 
little pin feather things over here as well while I have this color in my brush. These things are done with, um, I'm going to use my, I don't think white's going to show, so I'm going to use my gray lead. And I'm going to give them, just give me some lines here on top of my wash. And then I should be able to make like a series of little chevron strokes. Just to give a hint of a pattern. Okay. Now I'm going to go back doing the same technique, but I'm going to cover less area. And I'm going to do it, keeping it more towards, darker towards the end. Reload as I need to. I'm going to go into my darker color, the plantation, the plantation pine. Dirty brush once again. Okay. Same thing. I'm going to feel and see if it's dry. And that's going to give me a little bit stronger color. What's neat is it's picking up on all of this little um, texture that I've got going on here. If you haven't started yours and you didn't put texture there, you might want to think about going back and adding a little bit of texture before you get too far. I'm allowing the lines to do some of my line work for me. Bring it in. And I'd crossed over that one line, so I'm going to go kind of erase that. There is a tail feather that has a good beginning, and we'll keep going with this and, and kind of play around with it. And now I want to go and just liner shade one side of these little pin feather things. Just to give them a little bit of a look. We're going to do the same thing with our red. Okay, so we've got our wash, and then I'm going to switch down to a number four dry brush. And I'm going to load it in the same color that I washed with. And I'm going to flick on my paper towel. That's the thing I'm forgetting to tell you, is that you need to flick on your paper towel as this happens. Okay, so I'm going to just bring up a little bit of the color into... I want it streaky. In order for the streaks to happen, you have to have a juicy loaded brush, or you will get no streaks. You will only have a, just a dry kind of looking brush or whatever. So definitely, in order to get streaks, juicy is the key. Okay, so I'm just bringing that up, kind of shape following strokes. And see how that just deepened that color just a little bit. It didn't go overboard. I've got to reload. Like when I say juicy, I mean the top should be pearlized over with a big mound of paint. Otherwise, this will not work. Okay, so I'll bring this. And it's light pressure. Um, I had a little bubble in my uh, rock line just there, and so I needed to make sure that I flattened it out. And then we'll come down over here. And we'll put our darkest color, reloading again, up here into our feathers here. Okay, and that just deepens it just a bit. We'll see what else we need to do to that as we get going. I'm going to go in here and repeat the dry brushing to sink in. Deepen it up just a little bit. 
Now what I'm liking about this so far is I'm getting my tone from my underneath in my washes. So that's actually harmonizing my colors. So um, sometimes you can, you know, like you think um, you got to work real hard to harmonize, but all you have to do is just allow some of that background to show through. Right, one of the things that's different about dry rubbing versus dry brushing is with dry brushing, I can use my brush again right away. I just have to pinch out all the water. Okay, I don't want to have a whole bunch of water left in there because then I'll be dry washing. Okay, and these are pretty substantially thick brushes. Um, these are cut like an oval glaze. So they're shaved from side to side, and then they're also cut in an arch, which is what gives them the, the streaky look when you, um, when you load them this special way. They make terrible leaves. Don't ever try to use them for leaves. They're not, they're not a filbert brush. Filbert brushes are actually not shaved. They're cut just in the oval, so you don't get that graduated thing. So all the brushes leave the ground at the same time. So I'm going into the color, which I think I just popped in here, desert sand. I'm gonna get nice and juicy with the desert sand. And the first load takes a while because you gotta build it up. And you don't want ridges. I'm not reaching in and grabbing out a whole pile of paint. If, it, if I have ridges, I'm gonna work to get them worked into the brush. Okay, that's pretty shiny. If I see ridges when I flick on my paper towel, if I see like a strong ridge, I'm going to get that same thing on my project. So I want to make sure that I get a nice even look. Otherwise, I need to go blend things out. Okay, so we're going to come up from the breast of the bird. My lines are very, very thin, so it's a little hard to see where I've got things going. So I'll use my pencil. Okay, and he goes up like that, okay, and then up like that. This is going to be very close to the color that I already have, but that's okay. I just want to make sure that I, this might be a little bit more bleached sand looking. So I'm going to streak that northwards. Now I'll go into the next color up, which is the um, raw sienna. Definitely dirty brush on this, or I'm going to go straight orange. And I might even just load a little and then come back over here. Look on my paper towel. Make sure I'm dry, because wet paint sticks to wet paint. All right, so I'm going to line that up. Shape following mm -hmm. strokes. Okay, and that didn't change very much, did it? So we can go a little bit stronger. stronger and that wasn't very well blended. Now I'm not getting it strong enough. So I'm going to wipe out my color, but not wipe wipe. Just kind of wipe. Flick on the paper towel and that's very wet so I'll have to wait just a moment. Okay now I think I'm dry so I'll go over here and I'll get that a little bit deeper looking. Just pulling it up. Nice and streaky. Don't pull over the colors that you've already done. If I pull this dark color up into this, um, his comb and, or his um, feathers up here, then what I'll end up with is just a dark line. So we want that faded look. That's what we're after. Repeat one more time just to get it deeply darker. Okay, and that just sinks down in there nicely. Okay. And do you know what I think? I think I'm missing some tail feathers. Ruh -ruh. All right, next we're going to go and I'm going to move down to my grapes. My grapes are more unknown to me than my chicken is. So when I get my grapes kind of going in the direction they're going to go, I'm going to know what colors I want to put in my chicken. So sometimes I make these decisions out. All right, and I'm just going to take my taupe and I'm just going to glaze each little grape individually. I can leave it a little bit wishy-washy um, because I'm really going for that textured look. 
by leaving a little bit of space between each one and doing them and treating them individually, then what I'm going to get is, um, by A, I don't have to retrace my lines, but I'm just going to get a little bit more artistic looking uh, watercolor maybe look. I'll do that to all of the grapes. Hi, right, so I'm really, really glad that I started my grapes so that I could kind of see where I'm going here. This color purple and these colors that I have going on up here are not a happy family just yet. So before I get much further, I'm going to go ahead and do an experiment, which is I'm very happy that I have my little experimental cloth here. So I'm going to do some playing around on this and see if I get a color combination I like. I'm using the um, curved flat for this shading. I'm going to be doing a bunch of C-strokes on these grapes. I did decide that I'm going to stick with this color, but I'm going to kind of mix up my top coats. Um, I'll talk to you about that as we go along. Okay, so I'm going to float, which is using water, and then I'm going to start with my heritage, is it heritage brick? Something brick. Heritage brick. Okay, and I'm going to choose some of my grapes, and I'm just going to wash in, and I want this watery washy, okay, some of my grapes, some are going to be a different color. If I don't get washy, I'm going to get dry brushy, and if I get dry brushy, which means that dried look, that's a bad thing. So I'm going to take, and we're going to use the water drop trick, there's my palette paper, I'm going to mist, 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 and what this is going to do for me is this is going to give me these little bubbles, and I can simply go into them as I dry up and just keep refreshing my wash or my float so that I can keep floating without continually loading my brush. Okay. I want this washy floaty instead of floaty floaty. I don't need it real strong and I am going to walk it in just a little bit. You're going to use shape following strokes, which means that on the outside you'll go around that way and then walk it in. On the inside you'll go up next to, and be careful don't cut through, so I can go up next to that grape, but then I have to wait before I can complete that. Um, and this can just almost be a wash here in the middle. wait for that and while I'm waiting for that I can come back up here and finish this. Now what I've got to do is I've got to kind of round that out a little bit. I don't want those sharp corners on my round grapes. Okay so and I'll just continue. Some almost get washed and some get floated. And I think the, the difference is going to be that we want to celebrate the variation of it. Don't make them all the same. If you make them all the same, you won't get that depth of field. Some can be strong. Some can be weaker. Some are on top, some are behind. You get the idea. Okay, we'll come over here and we'll do some of the same stuff. These little curved flat brushes, I'm quite, quite, quite impressed with them. Still using my original sets that I had for the poinsettias and the nutcrackers and all the projects that I've done lately. Still using the very same brushes, um, and that's project after project. Um, they don't seem to get a buildup in the ferrule. I don't know why. I um, haven't figured that out yet. When I do, I'll let you know. I'll be screaming it from the rooftops. Hey, I figured this out. And this is, once again, this is just part of the blocking process. Um, we're not really on the grape painting process. I mean, this is the way they're getting painted, but I think they're just being treated a little bit differently than you might be used to. We could flip over and we could shade the other sides of things as we needed. Every now and again I'll blot the 
dirty side or the clean side where the water is on my brush. Notice that I'm painting my leaves last, and the reason I'm doing that is because um, in some cases, my leaves are gonna fall down over, and so I wanna just treat them like they're not there. So I can just paint where my leaves are gonna go and not worry. about the shape of my floats and things like that. So in essence, we're kind of building a set of red grapes instead of purple, but I want to keep a little bit of a purple cast to them. How I'm exactly going to do that, I don't know yet. But by starting with that kind of purple under hue, I think that's going to be how, part of how it helps. that are on the very tiply tops are the ones that will give a stronger so once again we're doing this in a sheer background kind of wash colors and that means that all of the texture in our backgrounds is showing through, it's marrying and unifying everything. We're kind of self-highlighting already because we're allowing the background color to be the shadow, the highlight for the grapes. Okay, at this point, even though I said not to, I've almost washed everything with a little bit of this heritage brick color. So at this point, I'm not going to fight myself. I'm just going to go on and finish creating the shapes with the heritage brick color. And now we're going to go in, let's find a way, we're going to kiss some of these with a little kiss of the Crimson Tide. So I'm not sure which ones, maybe the top ones? So maybe we'll make those be just a little bit redder. And that'll give a different kind of tone. And we'll kind of wash over these top grapes with Crimson Tide. This guy didn't finish his shading. And go over here. It's not really a top grape. So I blotted it out with my finger, no problem. punctuate just some of them. Okay, now let's go thicken in some bottom grapes. And what we'll do is we'll mix in our purple and a little bit of the um, heritage brick in my brush together. And then those are going to be our more, oops, strongly floated. So what do I do about that? I just go in, I wipe it off, and I don't worry. I'm blotting my brush. I 
Annika. Not so much maybe with the Heritage Brick. This is the color is Plum. And because we've already got that other color there, we can have some of these cooler background grapes be plummier, which will help set them back just a little bit. And a little bit more water. That little water drop trick has just saved my bacon so many times. Makes it so much easier to control your floats and your colors. And it makes painting just a little bit snappier. Alright, so we've got just a little bit of this and that going on here. Obviously we don't want big white spaces in our grapes. Same thing over here. Stuff that's underneath will make into a bluer color. And now speaking of blue, let's go in and see if we can't make a little teeny bit of blue work with this. I don't know if we're going to be able to or not. Very, very sheer. And I think we'll flip it over. And we'll pick on our background grapes. Our under, under, under grapes. This is Admiral Blue. We don't want to turn them into blue grapes or blueberries. Okay, now we've got random great placement. Now I think it's time to kind of make these little guys pop. And I think that's going to have to be with color. So I'm going to go into the Crimson Tide. And now it's time to make a couple of them really say, ta-da, here I am. Got some grapes hanging there. Now what we can do here is we can do one of two things. We can continue with our grapes or we can now go switch into our leaves. Now what we do have is a little bit more of a concise story going on here. This red is picked up up here. We can put a little bit of our blues and colors in this. Um, that gives me the opportunity to move back and forth amongst the colors. Okay, so I think we're a little bit better than where I was going. almost can't see my leaves, so I'm going to have to go ahead and trace those again. I'm going to approach our, our grape leaves the same way that we approached the rooster tail. So we're going to do a wash with the um, green, whatever this thing is, a slight green. Okay, and I still can almost not see my lines. I don't want to make them so dark that I, they're screaming at me, but I want to be able to see what I'm doing. Just nice thin wash. Don't really have to blot on this textured background. If you were on a smooth background, you would be floating all over the place. So that's what the difference is. Texture is just kind of sucking it all in. And 
We'll just do the same technique to all of the grape, of the grape leaves. Okay, my leaves are dry and I'm loading my brush in the shale and then dirty brush loading it into the avocado. Looking on the paper towel and then I think we're going to brush in from the leaf ends. Just misting it. Just to draw in just a little bit of that color. The greener color. Using my chisel, use the chisel to get those striations that you're going to have in leaves. And remember our stem kind of comes through here, so everything should kind of come back to the stem line. Not necessarily to the stem top, but to the stem line. Should kind of all be pointing in that direction. And I'm using this big brush so I can get nice wide dry brush strokes. Shape following. To keep it lighter on to the inside. Okay, we're just going to treat all of these leaves about the same. I get little incidental streaks, I won't care. We've got some kind of blocking, color blocking going on. I'm going to go into the Plantation Pine Dirty Brush. If you have to wash your brush off or go and change subjects or something like that, um, make sure to wash it out, dry it out, reload it in the other colors, otherwise you'll end up with um, things that don't quite work right. So now we'll deepen. And this time we're going to try not to deepen everywhere the same. So we're going to deepen some places, but not every places. Maybe I'll come over here next to this where this leaf kind of does its thing over here. And that will give us a little bit of variation. It's almost a side loaded kind of thing. Oops, we missed one. Under here. Keep you on camera. Okay. And we've got a little bit of same, 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 same going on here, and I don't want that. So I'll be doing some work trying to get that not to happen. All of my leaves are exactly the same shadow, exact same light. I don't like that. It's too matchy-matchy for me. The stragglers, if you get any straggling kind of things going on, um, are magical moments. Don't fix them. They're going to help your leaves look a little more natural. Okay. Now we're going to fix this same, same, same. Okay, we're going to take our olive green 
and we're gonna let's be putting this where things will be lighter coming up from edges and this is just a very dry in the brush dry brush this wouldn't necessarily be lighter and I'm just kind of adding a glaze or a hint of this here and there So now that's going to allow us a little bit of a dappled leaf type look in theory. Okay. I just want those hints. We'll go up into his tail and do a little bit of the same thing. Just a little bit of bottle, and I might even do this so just a tiny bit stronger. Hey, watch when you're painting. I was just curling up my rock lawn and bringing it in. Watch that. Um, you don't want to wreck it while you're painting it. So once again, not everywhere. That's the trickiest thing for people is generally speaking when they think they like something they'll put it just everywhere. And that's not what we need to do. Okay, so that gives us a little more modeled look. I think now we need to add a little bit of our stem type behavior so that we can see where we're going next. All right, we're gonna do our stems. I wanna make a dirty brown. I don't want it to be all green and I don't want it to be all brown. So I wanna just make a dirty brown and I want it thinned and I'm gonna use a round brush. So I'm mixing, is it bittersweet? Bittersweet chocolate and my plantation pine. And then I want to wash just a little bit. I want it very runny. I want it runny so that I don't end up with it very strong colored. If it's too strong a color, it won't fit with our palette because our palette is all these soft, transparent colors. And if it's not runny enough, it won't ever base coat over these um, things. So that's, that's a good dark without being ridiculous. Okay, I'll go ahead and just kind of loosely line. So I don't want this too to color book, I guess, and I don't want it too transparent. I want it obvious without being crazy, and I can't tell where that's going to. <laughs> we'll figure that out in a minute. Okay, so we'll bring in also a little bit with our um, veins here, and that we're just going to get up on our pointy tippy toe here. And I want those to fade as they get to the outer edges. Okay, so we'll bring out veins. The stronger my leaf color, the stronger my vein color can get. And not everything has to touch everywhere, don't worry about that. And as you get down your leaf, um, make sure that you're lifting up to the tippy toe so that you're not um, having a blunt line at the end. Okay, and I'll go back and I'll deepen some of these that have faded too much. This one's coming in to the grapes. We can go in and we can glaze just a little bit here and there with our reds to carry things around. Normally I glaze at the end, and I'm probably going to stop right now. I'm going to glaze in my deeper areas. Just to give that breaking up of color. Glazes can be really beautiful things. Okay, I figured out my missing line was my stem. Okay, so bring 
that down, our cut branch. And then we've got these lovely little tendrils, which will be just a little bit finer. Kind of fading off to the end. That was just really odd. You know, I've neglected this poor little leaf down there the whole time. All right. Then what we can do is we can go back with our bright leaf green color, our olive green. And we can go in and give it a little bit of a highlight down the middle of these stems where they need it. Just to give it a highlighted kind of a look. Shape following, that was not good. Gives them a little bit more roundness. More depth. That little bit of red glazing in the leaf looks really nice. I'm going to go into some of our in between our grape leaves and backgrounds with the same color as the stems. It's kind of a dirty satin color. And let's see, where am I thinking? Maybe here. Just want, I don't want there to be a halo around my grapes. And as you get out more into the light, you would not have as much of that going on. Just deepening that color down there. So this is getting pretty light up there, so I'll stop. airiness is I guess maybe not light so much as airiness. I also want to take my I'm going to take my brown and I'm going to tone the heritage brick with my brown. And then I want to give some of these grapes the background treatment. Give them, push them completely back by making them an indistinguishable darker color. We go edge to edge, line to line, right back here. Darker is going to give them a little more weight. There's some of these little V's and things that need to be beat in just a little bit. The places where it looks like something else could be happening, but we're not quite sure what. They're just little quiet spots. <clears throat> And then we'll go and sink a few more of these. Sit back over here. Maybe over here. Looking for opportunities for things to go backwards. Over here, I've got a little too much light in between my grapes over here. When I did my other washes, I didn't continue to fill them in, so those lights need to go away. Same thing going on over here. Now as we get away from the center of interest, we don't want to create things that will 
cause you to see them more. So we want to be careful to keep things kind of hush-hush over here on the edges. So a missing grape. And a missing grape. So same thing going on here. We've got this light halo going on around. When I get a little bit deeper in colors, okay, I want to go a little bit more plum in my plum areas. I need to get a little browner in my red areas, but I may have to go a little redder first. Let's redden up a couple of these a little bit more. <clears throat> Seal in my little white areas here. And I sit back and I'll squint at things, try it. It really helps sometimes. Well, I've got some highlighting to do. I'm a little concerned that my highlights aren't gonna show. <clears throat> so making things a little bit stronger in color is how I'm going to ensure that my highlights do show. Okay, so those are getting stronger. We'll see. This is where we can let it rest a little bit and we can we can let the story kind of unfold. Now we'll go back up and work on the chicken and then we'll see, you know, we've got these colors here and we've got these colors here and they're going together. So now we'll see what the chicken tells us. Okay, I've got some, let's see, desert sand in my brush and I'm gonna come over here and just give it that color Off a very dry, dry brush. I think we're going to make his saddle feathers be this brown color, so I'll poke a hole in my raw sienna and dirty brush load. Now I'm going to bring it really strongly out of here. And then I want to almost side load and get some streaks. I'm going to start my feather action here. So I'll draw it up. I'm just kind of give those that little ha cha cha. Okay, the breast doesn't get that same treatment because it has smaller feather types. Okay, and I'm thinking that my leg needs to pretty much be the same color. The question that I have is where would it be the same color? I wanted to try doing one highlight. I'm gonna use the Crescent brush and I'm gonna do a little highlight rub on my grape. I wanna see if by doing this, I'm gonna get where I need to be finish wise. So then we'll do that and then add a white sparkle. Okay, we'll go in with our brush and just add that little bit of sparkly poo and see if I like that. So it's bleached sand. It's kind of a comma y stroke type. They don't all get the same level. I 
but that just kind of makes them pop a little bit more. I don't know what it is about that finished step. do the same kind of treatment. We're going to start with raw sienna though for this um, their legs. I deepened this with a little bit of burnt umber in the colors. Just kind of playing with it to see if I liked it. Okay, we're just going to bring this up. Shape following strokes, dry brushing. I've got a fairly dry brush, not too wet. I'm going to make this be a little bit richer brown. So we've got our gold. I think we're going to go, well, right now I don't know what we're going to do. Okay, then we'll go into our brown. I'm going to wipe out my brush. Burnt umber can be, like, taken over by colors. It's not a very domineering color. Okay, so I want that to dominate a little bit more than what it would normally do. Now we have a little bit of brown. I'm going to wipe out my brush. I'm going to pick up just raw sienna. I just want to warm up that leg just a little bit. Up here to the top. Warm this up as it's coming into the top. Love this scratchy kind of effect. We can bring just a little bit of the brown into the top of the wing. Let's see what we got here. We need to go and finish his head. Um, he has to have a little bit more crimson in his um, around his face here. So that all kind of gets to be crimson. Every now and then we'll check the pattern to see what in the world is going on. And then we'll dry brush, pick up some of that darker color, and it's just going to be more intense to the front, pulling back, and then more intense from the back, pulling in. We need a beak. So we're going to make his beak be a, we'll start out with raw sienna, and then we'll have to go find a yellow. Take a look at a highlight. And then we'll go ahead and do his legs in the raw sienna as well, which I totally can't see. One of the gals from shipping came up um, looking for something while I was painting this, and she asked me if this um, was a background paper, and I thought that was a lovely compliment um, because that's exactly the kind of effect that I'm trying to go for is to make this look like it's something that you could buy pre-done, you know. Okay, we've got this neck feathers. I'm going to start with raw sienna. You keep it on the chisel of my brush, allow some of those little things to escape off the back of his head. Little loose feathers, he's got his feathers ruffled maybe. Okay, so I don't want it to become the same color as this lower area. So we're going to just streak in, shape following streaks. And then I'm going to double load or dirty brush load into and Marigold. And give a 
this little blonde highlight streak treatment. Then we need to come into a little bit more of him over here, and we're going to need to give him some yellows in different parts of him. So here at his leg. We can't have him be just an isolated yellow color. Give him a few swoops on his tail. And then we'll bring down some yellow down into our leaves down here as well. A little bit on our grapes. So now that brings our colors together. They're not going to be all isolated. We probably could go into here and give him a couple of hayas on his leg. Here, I think this is going to need to be that same brown. I'll wipe out my brush. If I had a little yellow in it, that'd be okay. We'll start with raw sienna mixed with a little bit of burnt umber. Draw that right on up. Okay, now what I think we need is a little bit of lining action. So our bird needs just a little bit more detail. So let's go through and let him have some good old fashioned lines of feathers. We'll do the same thing over here. Give him an outline of burnt umber. And then let's give him some roughish feather lines. Same thing here on his leg. Let's go ahead and wah, stay in the lines. Got just a little crazy there. Give him little toenails. A little bit of chicken leg. We've got the same thing going on here. So this is just going to be our detail work, right? So this line here, I can get so you can see it. This wing is going to flow that way. Okay, and now we'll just pull some stuff. Actually, let's go ahead and detail up here first. Let's go ahead and give him these, these good detailed lines up here. So you can see where things stop and start. and then we'll chop some down in. Go over here, same thing. In a way, we're just giving him shading using line work and motorcycle noise. Sorry about the noise. It's a beautiful day today, and apparently everybody who rides a Harley is out on one. <clears throat> okay, so I'm liking that. That looks that looks good. He's got a good rustic look to him. Um, that's the way we want our bird to look. Look up here. We'll make the 
those feathers be. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of my um, bittersweet, and that's going to be our deeply darkest. And that's going to be where this front leg doesn't get much light back there, or the back leg. That'll be where this piece gets away from that piece. Up here, maybe, a little bit of these areas. Keep flipping my piece so that I can get a good pull on my brush. Okay, so yeah, that gives him a little bit of body and weight. I'll go here on the top again. We need to do some in his head. So let's go ahead and give him a little bit of umber up here. Coming out of the shadows. Ah. All right, we'll bring some down here, coming out of the shadows. and pulling that stuff out is good. Okay, so now let's go into um, Crimson Tide and the Bittersweet Chocolate. Bittersweet Chocolate has almost become our toning color for our darks. I don't know if you've noticed that. I'm making a shadow color out of two colors and I'm keeping the Bittersweet Chocolate as the, the uniform shadow maker, which is called using a mother color. Okay, so I'm, I'm unifying everything by doing the same thing to all the colors. So now what I'm doing is I'm deepening that shadow across his comb. Out from his eye, out from the bottom. So he's got that wonderful red that isn't too red. It's a good country red. Okay, and then we got to make his green feathers up here. Appear to be joining or doing something with these um, red feathers. I'm not quite sure how those all go together. This is where I get in trouble. I need to study my chickens a little more. Okay, then we'll go in Now I think I want to get into a little bit of trouble here. I want to go into a little bit of Viridian Green, which is this fantastic peacocky green color that is bright and wonderful and electric and oh my lord. Okay. And so I think what I'm wanting to do is streak it and then just wipe it with a little bit of moisture and on my finger is my moisture. And you know what's going to happen down on those leaves, I'm sure. Okay, that just brings just a little bit. Now we're going to have to tell the story the rest of the way as well with um, by moving this color around. You can't just have it sitting there by itself. So we're gonna need to bring it in here. Now we'll come down here. We'll make it come into some of these areas over here. Down in our stems. But that's not going to be enough. Okay, that isn't going to be enough. We need to bring it down into the darks of our leaves. Get some electricity down here.
and I dare say we even might need to sprinkle some love around in some of our background. Okay, and that's just leading down into, I'm just scumbling. Okay, now we're gonna do one more crazy stunt and we're gonna add some um, desert turquoise. Okay, we're gonna add that wherever we want it. And that I like on the edges of things like ghost shadows. So we might even come down over here and we might and I think I need a different color. The desert turquoise isn't as light as I want it. Okay, I got Indian turquoise out, and that is at least two values lighter, and I think it's gonna make me much happier. So up here in the tail, make a couple of these little swooshers be. And you can add that desert turquoise into the neck feathers. You can add it to the front of the leg. That looked chalky. I didn't like that. You can add it to the comb. Go down here, we'll add it on our grapes. side of our leaves, the cooler side. Actually, the cooler side would be not the lighter side in this case, but that's what side I'm adding it to. All right, that chilled things down just a little. I like that. Put it on this comb. Our poor chicken needs an eye. Let's give him an eye. Okay, we've given him a lamp black eye, and we're going to give him a little highlight. That's what you use styluses for now that you don't need them for your um, tracing anymore. Okay, we've got to get our beak a little highlight. And then we've also got to get a, a little shadow. Let's give it a little burnt umber line. Okay. So lo and behold, we're missing the whole entire back giant feather over here. thought there was something strange going on. And let's make that be a popper tail. Deepening our tails with the Viridian Green. And let's go show some love down here with our birdie and green as well. Okay. A little bit more. I think that's good. Okay, I just washed my harvest word with the um, that color. The Crimson Tide plus a teeny bit of the bittersweet chocolate. Now I'm going to go with burnt umber. I'm going to dry brush down the tops of my letters with my round brush. No exacting technique here, just darkening the tops. I wanted this, well I thought about doing this the opposite way, but I think I'm okay with it being just like a happy accident that it ended up this way, because I kind of like it. It brings those grapes up into the chicken a little bit. Okay, now we'll do a little bit of drop, sh um, drop shading. I'm just going to be with our black. I'm a little worried the black's going to be too strong, so I'm going to tone. How about let's add a little black to our bittersweet chocolate and add some water. Black is the coldest color, so black can really, really do some damage if you're not really careful. I'll just do it on one side. Black's also a very cool color. Very cold. That just gives our letters a little bit of finish and a little bit of depth. 
they were very rough letters when I traced them, but I've just smoothed them out just a little bit. And our texture is taking care of the rest, so we won't worry about that. could bring in some highlights into the word, but I don't think I need to. I could dry rub some different accents. I think, I think, I think, I think I might be okay with this. Um, like I love it. So now I'm going to take my glass palette and I'm going to cut out my little letters here. I want to use my, this is the sharpest, 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 sharpest detailed little knife ever. Um, you're going to lay it on your glass palette that has a little bit of tacking over and over. You could use a tile as well. And then you just will cut out all of your letters and um, take it all the way to this edge. And take it short strokes at a time. We're going to use our compass. This is a half pipe compass that comes with a cap so you don't stab yourself on the point. And bestest, bestest of all, it comes with a um, lead on board right here in the, the tail end so that you never run out when you lose or break your compass lead. All right, I'm going to make a border line, so I'm just going to run that along. And hang on to it from the back side and you won't make the compass tweak in. I'm going to use green stretchy tape to get a perfectly even line all the way around so it almost makes myself in a, a almost a stencil. This you just pull it as you're turning the corner and it actually stretches and it'll make a nice smooth line and that way you can get a perfectly wonderful base coated line. I'm going to do a little faux finish on this so I don't want, actually, let's see I'm going to have to trim that. I don't want to have, um, as soon as I'm done doing two things at once, I can talk. Okay. I don't want to have to be really, really careful with everything that I'm doing. I want to just be able to kind of be sloppy and quick, and this uh, will allow me to do that. Do it all in one fell swoop there. I like the green that I've got base coated on my other topper, so I'm just going to go ahead and replicate that. You really could use that topper if you've already got it done. I also like the scrolls that are on it as well. Okay, so see how I'm fighting with that? I'm trying to get the base coat in there. Time to get out our little fingertip dauber. And then I don't worry about my edge. I don't worry about brushing paint under the stencil, this goes so much faster, it's so much easier. Thank God for scrapbookers, which is where I found this little gem. Okay, and of course, you know, we carry it on the website too. But, okay, so we'll get these all on there. I guess you don't need to see how to tap paint for 800 hours. The fingertip daubers, I just plunk them in water and then I go and wash them at the end of my project. We need an open-toed bristle um, foliage brush, and we're going to go into that lighter green mixed in with, um, I don't want to get out another green just for this little technique here. Um, so the olive green mixed with the avocado green, and just leave some little, almost like sponged looking faux finish kind of thing. randomly. And then we can go into the plantation pine with the dirty brush and also randomly put some of that in there. Rock your brush, turn it from side to side so you don't get a pattern. Reverse it, whatever you need to do. Now let's go into just a touch 
of the phthalo just to bring that color in. Now if you want to keep it generic, keep it just green. Depends on what your motivation here is. Okay, and then we just peel off our tape. And how easy and wonderful is that? Okay, I'm going to use my brass metal powder. The gold is beautiful as well. Um, it's a personal preference. What I love about the metal powders is you know how when you use uh, metallic paints, they don't cover. Well, I can put as much powder in this as I want and it will cover because I've made it cover. That makes sense. The brass is just a little bit brighter than the gold and in this case I want just a little bit of a brighter look. I'm just going to line gently right next to my faux finish. Thankfully my faux finish is rough and so is my background so I won't have to worry about being exact. And that will give us just a little bit of a glimmer, a little bit of a finished edge. Okay, I've got the Elegant Scroll stencil, and I am going to just lay this down here. And I'm going to center this so it's coming out of like the number three position on the clock. And I'm just going to put a little scroll action. Just a little empty, needs a little something. This one, this stencil is a little bit looser than some stencils, so you want to make sure you hold it down. Tack it over and over would be a really good idea as well. You see how that's vibrating and rubbing? Um, let's do a little experiment here. Let's show you what the difference would be. With some tacket. Okay, so there's a little scroll. This side over here, where is our school? Okay, so I can apply, I'm going to use the um, ink sweeper, which is the same thing as a fingertip dauber, to apply, tack it over and over to this stencil. I'm going to go right on my nonstick mat, and what I love about this, and you do a thin coat, if you, the thicker you get, the more grab you get. And so we want this to be not so grabby, we want it to be grabby but not so grabby any sense. Okay, and we're going to do this little guy here. What I love about the nonstick mat is this stuff will wipe off of our nonstick mat very easily, and it doesn't like to wipe off of too much of anything. We'll let that dry till it's clear, and then we'll just take a wipe that has a little cleaner in it. Um, they make a goof-off wipe. This is a no-name thing that I don't even know where they where I got it. And that just wipes that tack it right off of there. And then just buff that off, and no sticky mess. The tacket is actually intended for um, fabric, so if you are a sewer as well, you can find it um, on our website, and it will do appliques and things like that. But it is a great stencil adhesive. Um, we've been known to put it on the back of rock lawn, let it dry, and then it removes cat hair. Um, puts up posters, it makes post-it notes out of things. Um, you can put it just in little corners. It's it's really a versatile product. It's crazy versatile, actually. Okay, as soon as that dries, we'll finish that. All right, while we're waiting for that to dry, we will go into our bittersweet chocolate. And we're going to use our white wonder brush. We're going to spatter around the edges. This test. Spattering just gives us a little diffusion. Helps marry colors together. We could spatter with a little bit of our gold. Which I think we've already talked about. And I'll grab my um, Rooster base, and I think he could use some spattering up the sides here.
kind of general areas around the piece. I also think what you can do is you can take and you can spatter strategically into um, some of the colors that you have out. So for example, we can go into this bright um, green, olive green, and I can spatter right where my leaves are having that bright green. I can give his tail a couple of spatters. Just adds a little bit of something. And go into a little bit of white. Spatter around. I don't like them. The best tool for spatter removal is a Q-tip, which is a pointy Q-tip, and it just sucks life out of spatters if I don't like where they landed. And they don't throw them away when you first use them because they actually, um, they dry and then they reabsorb. They're not like fuzzy ended q-tips. Okay, so I think, I think I can like that. Let's see if we're dry here. Okay, so now the difference between this with the tacket on the other side. That looks clear. Okay, we want to make sure we're coming out of the same side. Okay, so now the difference is just going here. that just lays down there and it adheres. It's not bouncing up and down. I'm going to get a much better contact, and if I was on something where I didn't want any kind of bleed under, the tacket helps prevent any bleed under. Should I do two lines or just the one? Okay. Okay, so here the difference, and then it just peels, ah, peels off. Okay, and now we'll do the other little detail there. Okay, our last little touch before we put our hands and works and things on it, are we going to put a couple of little fingertip berries in the red color? Kind of faded, not too bright, not too, not too crazy. You could shade them and highlight them and do some things to them if you wanted to. Okay, and then wipe your finger off, of course. And we can add some sweet little ghost leaves off of our scroll here. And too much water. And these are just going to be little hints of leaves. Here and there. Just to give it just that little bit of pop. And they're, because they're ghost leaves, you don't have to worry about doing too much craziness with them. 